introduce myself. I'm Bob Wernley. Uh, I'm the, uh, on the committee of the, of the oral history section of the Montgomery County Historical Society. And uh, we've been doing a number of these interviews, uh, many, many interviews. We started back old, back at the time of the Gulf War, uh, interviewing uh, veterans uh, mainly of, of World War II. Uh, the, the, the fellows that were in World War I are all gone now. And Cook can't do them. The guys from the Civil War, they, they tell their stories, but those are all long since gone. But we, we've had so many men and uh, so many men and women in Montgomery County who had interesting experiences in, in World War II. Of course, we've, uh, and then in the Korean War, and later on in, the, in Vietnam. And today, uh, we're interviewing another, uh, and I'll, I'll just ask her, give us your full name, John. John Eugene Serbies. And uh, <coughs> how old are you? I'm 76. And what, what was your date of birth? August 9th, 1923. And who were your parents, John? Oscar and Gladys Serbies. Were they people from the county here, or did you move here afterwards? No, sir. Uh, my dad and mother were both born in, in uh, Scott, well, my father was born in Scott Township, and my mother was born in uh, Montgomery County, I don't remember. Uh, so they're, okay. they're both Montgomery County natives. Yes. What uh, heritage were they, were they English or what? They were uh, Scotch-Irish. And yeah, I that's where you got your red hair. I did not know that until I went to service and was put in uh, to a company that were made up of boys from the East, uh, Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, mm -hmm. and they asked my nationality. And I thought I was a Hoosier. I, uh, you know, that, that was, and I had to write home to my mother to find out what nationality I was. And it was, yeah, she wrote back that it was Scotch Irish. Oh, well, work. <laughs> so you were born here in the county, and uh, uh, where did you go to school? I uh, started school at Newmarket. The building was almost new at that time, I think about two years old. E.O. Kirkpatrick was the principal, and I went there six years, and my mother, mother and father moved to a farm south of Crawfordsville. I went to school at Whitesville one year, and then came to Crawfordsville High School. Was Whiteville a high school at that time? No, no, it was a the first uh, seven grades. So you went to Crawford Hill High School? Yes. And when did you get out of... Uh, 1941, when I graduated from high school. And uh, uh, when you graduated from high school, uh, what, what did you do right after getting out of school? I worked for Hoosier Crown Bottle Cap Factory. I worked seven nights a week from uh, midnight to seven in the morning. And one of my classmates... Was uh, that Bob Smith's outfit? No, yes, that was his okay. outfit. But at that time, uh, oh, the old gentleman, Sam, uh, I can't recall his last name. There, uh, Sam Harris was, there were three of us that worked at night. And uh, they started me out counting bad bottle caps and it was just like counting sheep and and they said they they said if I could someone told me that worked at the factory said if you can stay a week at this job they'll keep you on and I, and it was just you just sorted bad caps at that time and we made bottle it, of course the war was gone and we made bottle caps out of used metal cans and cut them up and it was a real crude operation where was the plant located? Uh, and on uh, Covington, no, not Covington Street. It's down where, uh, just north of the Kentucky Fried Chicken now. Oh, yeah. And I worked there at night, and I would help my father farm until noon or middle of the afternoon, depending on the weather, and then uh, come to work every night, seven nights a week from midnight to seven. Seven? Seven nights a week? Seven nights a week, yes, sir. 
And we, uh, of course, you were out of school. Yes. Uh, did you? Uh, the war was threatening at that time. I mean, you were, you were, you could see that uh, you were going to get drafted or something. Like yes, that. sir. Yes, what sir. Did, I tried to enlist, and was told that uh, this they keep doing what I was doing that they was going to draft me. Uh -huh. I tried to enlist. Who and, was uh, running the draft board at that time? Uh, was it Walter Spencer? Walter Spencer, the attorney, yes sir. Okay. <laughs> and they said that they uh, they wouldn't let me enlist because they were going to draft me. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I got my physical, I've got real high arches. And the old story about turning people down because they were flat-footed, they almost turned me down because my arches were so high and they never did bother me. Can you remember <laughs> remember those first days when you uh, what what when you got your draft notice? What happened? Uh, they that year and that was in '43, and I knew I was going to service, and I was just waiting on the call. And from December until the latter part of February. I went ice fishing about every day. I helped my father uh, do the farm chores twice a day. But, uh, I was just waiting to go, and uh, then I was I left Crawfordsville on March the eighth of 1943. What uh, were any of your uh, friends go with you? Uh, uh, yes, Stanley Norman was one that I remember distinctly. It was on the bus. Uh, I didn't know many of the people. No, sir. Was, was Stanley a Crawfordsville High School? Uh, you yeah. know, I, I can't tell you that. I've known mm -hmm. him uh, seen ever since that time, but I don't. I didn't know him that well. He's a little older than I am, mm -hmm. but I didn't know him in high school. No, a uh, classmate of mine, John Miller. I'd say we graduated in '41. He got out of school at Christmas time, and went directly into service and was killed in action before I graduated in the spring of 41. Excuse me, you suppose we ought to, uh, uh, is that going to interfere? I don't think it's going to hurt us. Okay, I can't. all right. Let's, <coughs> let's go ahead then. Okay. Okay. All right, uh, Stead, who was killed in action? John Miller. Uh, he was a young man from the Mount Zion area. Oh. And I, I don't know that he was the first from this county that was killed in action, but he was the first in my class in, in high school. And he had went to service and was killed before I went in. Do uh -huh. you uh, remember anything about uh, when that news hit the county? Or how? Yes, I'm, uh, my mother and father had dear friends that lived on Curtis Street. And they were listening to the radio, and they had one daughter, and she and I were outside, and our parents yelled at us to tell us about that the Japanese had struck Pearl Harbor. Huh. And it didn't mean that much to me uh, that day, but it soon did, not shortly time after that. I'm good. So, but when that news came through about this boy being killed. Oh, that, I was, uh... That must have been uh, yes. that pretty hard on your yes. parents. Well, uh, he and I had uh, been pretty good friends, and uh, we had a man by the name of Foxworthy that held numerous offices in the courthouse. And he had a purebred shorthorn cow that had four calves, which was a rarity. And John and I had taken those four animals to Chicago to the livestock show the year before. That is always, at that time, was held right during the Thanksgiving week. And the stockyards is, was on uh, Halstead, if my memory served me right. And we walked from the stockyards to a house where we rented up one room for a week or ten days. 
And he, here we were high school students and walked before daylight in the morning to take care of those cattle and sometimes after dark and didn't think anything about it. And now the stockyards is gone, but you wouldn't walk that street with, yeah. even with an armed guard today. No, you wouldn't. Walk to the street. Right. And, uh, but there is a lot of romance about that old stockyards. And, but that was my first experience up there. And John Miller and I stayed, we were roommates up there. And that would have been in 1940, I think it was. Mm -hmm. But, uh, okay, uh, then uh, tell us about your uh, getting, uh, you're going off, you went off on a bus, sir. Yes, we went on a bus to Fort Bend and was inducted and uh, it was in like March 8th of 43 and they shipped me to Gaston, Alabama, uh, Camp, Camp Seaborn. It was a chemical warfare camp and we wore gas masks almost 24 hours a day and I hated it and we went into cement block buildings that had gas pumped in there and uh, I volunteered for anything and everything to get out of that chemical warfare. I didn't like it. Well, but do you have any idea why you happened to get selected for that? No, they were just picking us at random oh. and there was like 50 people and I didn't know any of them from from Fort Bend that went oh. there. And it was only, I think it's like 500 miles maybe and it was close enough to home that I was homesick all the time. Uh, when I got was sent overseas, I was so far away from home, it didn't bother me then. But what, uh, John, what was, uh, you say you were homesick, what your family consist of? Uh, my mother and father uh, had twin brothers that died at birth in 1926, I believe it was. And, uh, they would probably have saved, they were two boys, and they would probably have been saved in today's medical yeah. society. But uh, they, I was, uh, had a steady girlfriend, and I missed her. Did you, you didn't have any siblings then other than? No, no, okay. no. Uh, they, uh, but they sent me to Alabama, and they cut off all my hair and gave me my inoculations, and it was, the weather wasn't that cold, but I thought it'd freeze to death, and I never. They cut off your hair. What they, you? they they give me a better haircut, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the uh, uh, all the inoculations I had, I think that had a little something to do with it. And being in a strange area, and I was just it was in March, and in in Montgomery County, the sun was shining. They were sowing oats, and and I wanted to be here. I did not like Alabama. So I volunteered for, would have volunteered for a suicide mission to get out of the chemical warfare training. Didn't like it, didn't like any part of it, and uh, so I held up my hand one day for volunteers and it was, I found out later it was for Cooks and Baker School. And I went to Cooks and Baker School and then I was shipped to uh, Camp Shanks, New York and was responsible for the feeding of 10,000 men, three meals a day, and it, it was a port of embarkation. And I was at Shanks for a while and I traveled uh, on troop trains from Camp Shanks to uh, California. It took us uh, maybe uh, 45 days to go out there and come back. And they, what we were transporting were pilots that had been in England and they had so many missions to fly and they were being discharged. And they had no desire to eat. All they wanted to do was party. They were so glad to be back home. So I seen uh, the United States from a open cook door. And we, of course, the You were cooking on a train. Yes. And they, <laughs> they, uh, You know, I've seen those. <laughs> Tell us that, what, was it a box car made into it? Yeah, a, yeah. So it had the old uh, coal fired number five ranges in it, and they and a lot of them, uh, 
the pilots, uh, if we went through their hometown, they jumped off, and sometimes we didn't have half as many when we got the Californias we'd started with, and they had they had most of them had no desire to eat. We seen. Uh, the backside of all the towns between New York and the Presidio of Monterey in California. Oh, and, uh, did you, uh, what, what route did they go down the south? We went the southern route, yes, yeah. most of the time, and uh, went both ways, but, but we, I came back. You mean you went, traveled back and forth uh, every yeah. day? Uh, oh, well, we would leave New York and maybe it could be as long as 60 days before I was back at camp. Uh -huh. And my wife was uh, like, 17, 18 years old. You were married by that? Yes, time? I was well, married then. When did you get married? Uh, in October uh, the 8th of 1943. <clears throat> and uh, she worked in a sewing factory, uh, almost slave labor. And, uh, in the Crawfordville here? No, no, in, in uh, New Jersey and in New York. We, oh. we lived, uh, I was stationed at Shanks and we where we lived in a little town, uh, Yonkers, New York, was one, and we lived in uh, New Jersey, oh, the town that uh, Rutgers University, New Brunswick, New Jersey. Yeah. We found she or I, either one, had hardly been out of Montgomery County. I'd been to the State Fair a couple of times in Chicago at the World's Fair, maybe one time, and. She hadn't been very far from home, and we found every color, creed, religion. There were very nice people. We lived with a Polish Jew family, and they were extremely good to us. They just took us like we were their children. We learned that there was a lots and lots of good black people. Uh, Every nationality we lived with seemed like we didn't stay in one place very long. And well, did you? How uh, how do you have enough money? Uh, were you getting an allowance as a married man? Uh, no, I was getting twenty-one dollars a month. But I and your wife was making the money to pay the rent. Yes, yeah. and she didn't make very much. Uh, I don't recall, but they paid her in cash, and she made friends with a large girl from Texas and the man that owned the garment factory would try to cheat, cheat each employee anywhere from three cents to a dime and when they got their money they'd sit down and count it and if they were short two cents they'd go back and have a big argument. They had no union at that time. But it was, uh, we lived uh, a lot of times uh, out of the mess hall uh, anything that was left over we took home to eat and uh, we lived with an Italian family. When I say lived with them, they occupied the first floor. We lived in an upstairs uh, one bedroom apartment and she was continually bringing uh, dishes of an evening and saying I cook too much. Well she done that on purpose. <laughs> and we went back and seen that couple oh, about, we had been gone from there I suppose 30 years. And she remembered my wife. I didn't remember either one of them. Uh, but my wife and her had been real close friends and, and they enjoyed the reunion very much. I was uh, in Damascus, Maryland, uh, to cry her for a cattle sale and we were that we were close enough that we just went by their house. And it was uh, a very emotional meeting. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. <laughs> we're, we're not, I guess we're serving meals here out of, uh, well, you say they had those old cold stoves on the, yes, they on the probably had <laughs> the doors of the box door open. And, oh, yeah, and I and said, the smoke on, coming in from the, yeah, and I uh, sat on a bucket and watched the, the backside of the, of the, the country going through. <laughs> and, uh, okay, well, tell us more about, uh, you didn't, you didn't keep on doing this forever? Oh, no, no. They sent me to uh, Camp Plush. Well, no. You got out of this uh, gas warfare, yes. chemical warfare yes. thing. Uh, how long were you in that? Oh, I don't recall. Maybe six months. Three, four to six months, probably. Uh -huh. And then, uh, but like I say, I volunteered for any time they wanted to volunteer. I wanted out of that 
that uh -huh. uh, aspect of us back. Uh -huh. And they were they were testing us on uh, gases that they used in World War One, phosgene gas and, mm -hmm. and nerve crippling gases and things. And uh, you, like I say, we had a gas mask on all the time, almost that we were on in training. And I just would do anything to get out of that. Well, did you have any adverse effects of this? No, no, they never. Uh, I wasn't. I done did exactly what they told me to do with that gas mask. But you would be uh, reprimanded if you didn't have a gas mask real close all the time. And then I went to uh, Camp Poche, Louisiana for my old paper. How do you spell that, John? I couldn't. <laughs> yeah, you mean Louisiana or Camp Poche? <laughs> Uh, it was a, there was a lake, a saltwater lake, uh, that was very close. And that's where I took my overseas training. And I got, I was in the transportation corps. And uh, they tried to learn me to swim. And I can't swim. I, uh, my instructor was a tough old nut. And he almost let me drown because he thought I was gold licking. And whenever I got water above my chin, I panicked. And I went down for the third time one day, and he jerked me out. And he said, "If your ship goes down, you'll go down too." And I never did learn to swim. I got sons, I got grandsons that can swim like fish, but I, I cannot swim. But I was in camp. Uh, my wife came to visit in New Orleans. And it was a different experience than. Did your wife go home then after? <clears throat> no, she. Well, no, she stayed in New York until I went overseas, and then when I went overseas, she came back to Montgomery County. Okay, uh, you were you shipped out from overseas, or uh, how'd you get uh, transportation corps? What phase of that? Uh, I, trains or no? Or, uh, it was after fires. after the trains. I uh, when I went overseas with the transportation corps, I wasn't a cook then, and uh, we I spent the biggest part of my time overseas in Manila and Clark Field or close to Manila, and uh, I had was in charge of anywhere from sixty to eighty men that unloaded and loaded ships in the bay at, at Manila. Well, no, you, we're over in Manila. How yeah. did we get there? Well, uh, from, from Camp Luché, I, I don't recall how long I was there. But that was my overseas training. And then uh, I shipped out of... Uh, what did you do for overseas training? Oh, it was a uh, close order drill and... Uh, you went through basic? Well, I'd already had basic, but it was just Where, an Where did you get basic? In Camp Seabird, okay. Alabama, get near Gadsden. And then I left uh, Port of Embarkation in uh, San Francisco and went to Manila. And we took uh, the northern route. And on Saturday night, uh, and I, I do not recall the dates on this, but on Saturday night, the ocean looked like just a big flat mirror. It was a calm that, and before morning the ship was coming out of the water several feet and I thought it was going to shake all the rivets out of it. A little old Liberty ship <laughs> and uh, I got, I didn't get terribly sick but had ill effects from the crossing and when I returned I came in on a, on a large ship and oh, it was a smooth John. trip. Uh, we're going too fast here. Okay. Okay. You, uh, where'd you go when you you went from Louisiana out to California? Yes, sir. On a train, and where did you where did they put you off on the train? Uh, at the port of embarkation, and I can't I don't recall. Okay. Was it up about uh, Pittsburgh? No, don't think so. I think it was uh, uh, Presidio Monterey. Okay. If I, if I recall. And you got on and you got on a 
Liberatorship at uh, yes. San Francisco. Yes. And how long was the, the oh, tell us about your, uh, uh, who were you, who were you with? Were you with a company or? Yes. Uh, had uh, you been assigned by that time? Yes, yes, I was with a, I uh, can't remember the number, but a transportation company, <coughs> excuse me, and they, I didn't know anybody in the company when I went with them. And uh, it took us uh, 31 or two days to cross. cross. Uh -huh. well, by the door, well, and you, did you have any, were there any, did you sail at night? Uh, when you were at night, uh, at night, did you have blackouts on the ship? Oh, yes, yes. And uh, uh, did you have any escort? Uh, were there any uh, uh, warships? protecting their ships? There were at times. Uh, they didn't let the enlisted man know anything. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing you could maybe observe, and we felt like that we had a cruiser or two in, in our vicinity. Uh -huh. But as far as uh, we, we weren't informed of how many ships was in the convoy, there was more than the one, of course. Uh -huh. But Could you see any of the you Yes, see occasionally them? we would see one, but we still didn't know whether they were with us or going the other way. We didn't, uh -huh. couldn't tell that. Uh, you were still a private or a private first class? Yes, I was a private first class. And uh, uh, you, uh, you remember any of the fellows in, in your group at all? Uh, only one fellow uh, that lived in Ohio. His last name was uh, Gardner, Bob Gardner, and but I never. He was from uh, Finley, Ohio, and he and I buddied some. But I wasn't normally with a group. I was on the move all the time, uh -huh. and. Uh, what you do on board ship? Play cards. Uh, play a few cards and uh, slept a lot, uh -huh. and. Uh, when you could, because there was times that you couldn't sleep, but ship it was very rough, very rough. Just uh, sleep down in oh, yeah. inside the hole, all the way down, uh, yeah. um, in hammocks. I yes. Think. Uh huh. Oh, uh, and uh, I suppose sometimes you'd come up on the deck. And, oh yes, and then they sleep. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it was terribly hot and humid in the hole and you would come up and they would let so many at a time on the deck. Would you get to, uh, did you get to take a bath at all or? Oh yeah, we, we had showers and uh, occasionally, it wasn't an everyday thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, when you got to uh, over there to the Philippines, what stage was the war in at that time? What, um, you remember what day it was? <laughs> no, I don't. That uh, I really don't. It was in uh, uh, early part of '45, and the war was really winding down. But the Japanese didn't know that. The one mm -hmm. on Manila. In fact, after the war, I was still there, and we still had. Japanese coming out of the, of the hills and getting in our chow lines and uh, we were still having casualties because we had a water supply that close to our camp and uh, had more than one guard get uh, shot out there doing that guard duty and the war was officially over. Mm -hmm. Well, that just sounds a little strange. You mean the Japanese get out there and get into the... Oh yes, they, 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 they in, infiltrated our chow line. Well, the morning it would be pitch dark sometimes yeah. when we were in the chow line. And uh, they would have fatigues just like ours and get in the line. And after, later on in the day, we, people would get to visiting and talking and say, well, you know, so and so. <laughs> Uh, you get thinking back, yeah, he was Japanese, but they were they had a lot of nerve. And uh, we buy uh, bananas for uh, 
the five St. Davos was, uh, hey, let's see, I think a peso was worth a dollar, five St. Davos I think was a nickel, and we could see bananas from where we were located, but it was easier to give the Filipinos uh, five pesos for a banana rather than take a chance of getting shot if you went out to get a banana. Mm -hmm. Where, where were you? Uh, yeah. We're getting to the Philippines. And do you remember when you got there, where where they put you? Where where, where we, you live? In a bombed out building that, uh, see, the Japanese had went in and then the Americans came in and run the Japanese out. And some of the Filipinos that I worked with had such low esteem, uh, sometimes they would stand and let a truck run over them. And it was hard for us to understand, but some of them had lost a big part of their family when the Japanese came in and then lost the rest of their family or immediate family or maybe all of their family except their sales when the Americans came in. So... Uh, what do you mean? Why would they lose it when the Americans come in? Uh, well, they when the Americans came in, it was... Luzon had a lot of hills and hollers and uh, jungle-like features and uh, when the Americans came in uh, they to take the place there was a lot of civilians killed in, in that foray. Okay. Uh, so you were li living in an old uh, abandoned building? A bombed out building. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course uh, it would be 120 uh, some days. It's, of course, the, uh, you had that tropical weather and you could get wet in the rain and nobody ran for cover because you were dry in three minutes from there. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, I lived in a building that was not far from a big white building that you could see for several miles. It was a, like a Port Authority building. And uh, when we went in, they, uh, I thought one of the amazing things, a pilot from shore come out in a small boat and he guided the ship in and we could look over the rail and see ships. We were going, it seemed like just a few feet from the ships that had been sunk. There were just a few feet under the surface. And I thought that would be an ideal job. That man come out and bring our ship in and didn't hit anything. He knew where everything was in that mm -hmm. big area. You know. Now you, you know, were you, when you landed, that was Manila property? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. in Manila, Pier 14. I remember that. Uh, what did the city of Manila look? Did you get out to see Manila? Oh, yes. Uh, and what uh, was it? Pretty much a wreck. Oh, terrible! Just uh, building after building bombed. Uh, some with not hardly a building left. Some with little damage, and and then they had what they called uh, Wall City uh, in the downtown area. And the natives lived real primitive and uh, just barely existing. But yes, downtown Manila, I've had pictures of it. And uh, I've seen pictures since after it was rebuilt. And it is a beautiful city. Mm -hmm. uh, did, uh, how, how, did, how did the uh, Filipino people, uh, were you welcome or you, were they? Uh, yes, uh, they were. I'd say, yes, very welcome, because uh, they was hoping that, that was the end of the conflict mm -hmm. when we were there. Do you remember when did the conflict end? Were you there when, they, uh, when the yeah. Japanese surrendered? Yes, and uh, I remember when the president died, uh -huh. and we got that news 
maybe one day after it happened. We didn't hear immediately. And we, uh, our biggest talk in, in the company was what this would do to the war. Maybe prolong it or speed it up. Uh, everybody had an opinion on it. Uh, when the war ended, I was there, but it was, I don't recall that we had that any big celebration or anything. We were glad, but it, 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 oh. we didn't, we knew that we weren't going home immediately. Oh. And I think that slowed some of the jubilation down then. Of course, we had no idea what the, the big picture was. The, we only were told minor things and, and we lived in just a very, very small world, really. Uh, the leaders, I remember uh, McNutt was there. He was uh, sent over there as uh, the governor of the yeah. islands, I believe. And I remember walking by his mansion and seeing them uh, have white tablecloths and silverware on the table and, and eating off a of good china and we were still eating K rations and <laughs> what we could get. Were, did, they, did you get involved in cooking after that? No, no, I never cooked after I left the United <laughs> States. But I got tagged for all the fraternal organizations I belonged to and they found out I didn't know how to cook for large numbers. <laughs> and I've been doing that ever since. <laughs> Well, uh, now, we, uh, you, you say that the, the people were uh, very cordial to you. Oh, yes. Uh, and uh, were you still a BFC or did no, you? No, I got made corporal finally. Okay. And that's all I ever got. <clears throat> I didn't really, I, I didn't like soldier and I didn't mind the work, but I, just, I didn't like soldier <laughs> too well. I wasn't military cut. <laughs> Uh, oh, well, let's take a little recess here. My hearing aids began to. Okay. Okay. Uh, John, you said uh, you were shot at. Uh, uh, how'd that? how that happen? Well, I could say we had uh, there were snipers in the area, and uh, we all took turns at guard duty, guarding some things that weren't very valuable, like a, a water tower that only supplied a few people and things of that nature. But I wasn't actually in any combat. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you, uh, uh, did you, st these Japanese, uh, eventually, of course, they must have uh, gotten them, uh, by the time you left the Philippines, had they put things pretty much simmered down? Oh, yeah, they, they would, we would hear, scattered reports of the, of, they were just in the hills, they were dug in and, and entrenched back in there that it, 20 years later they were still digging them out. Uh -huh. or, and that, at least that's what I read in the press. Yeah. Did you, uh, uh, I was going to say, you, you described when we were taking a recess here about that equipment. Uh -huh. uh, Talk about that a little well, bit. Well, uh, we had large bulldozers and, and road graders and tanks. This was part of the Transportation Corps? Uh, no, the, it was, engineers. But, but yes, but we would uh, see this daily. They, we'd unload maybe several hundred bulldozers and they was put into a staging area and then just left there on the island to sink in the ground. Uh -huh. Okay, well now, John, uh, uh, can you remember uh, when the war in Europe ended? Can you remember that time? Well, not really. Uh, Had they, you already gotten to Japan by yeah, that time? No, I was no, I was in on Luzon at that time, and so by the time by when. The war ended in Europe, you were over there. Yes. And you and probably had, must have had a feeling of Oh that. yes, we had high hopes it was all went in. Uh -huh. But like I say, we our, our biggest, uh, I think, concern and talk and was when the president died and Truman took over. 
we all thought it might add three years to the war, or, or maybe uh, quicken no. the end of it. So, yeah. Well, John, uh, tell us about when you came back, uh, how you got back, and what happened then. I uh, had uh, injured my left knee in a accident aboard ship and they sent me uh, to be discharged at Camp Atterbury and the doctor said that if I would stay a couple of three weeks that they probably could uh, obtain a, a pension or some kind of substance for the injury and I was so sure that I didn't need it that I didn't stay I got discharged in a day or two and I hitchhiked home from Camp Atterbury and didn't regret it one bit, and I started farming. That was in 46, and I farmed until 56, and... Uh, Down there in your folks' place? Yes, and uh, I built a new house in 1947. Where is that, John? On the Dover Road, uh, three mile out. And it's not there now. The tornado uh, four years ago destroyed that home. And one of my sons has built a new house there. My oldest son lives in the farmhouse. My youngest son has. What is your, what's your family? How many kids did you have? And who are they? Well, Jim, Bob, and Bill. Sound like three mules, but that's their names. And <laughs> the oldest boy lives in the farmhouse. And his wife is the home economist in this county and he was a mortician with Powers Funeral Home that was her father and which is still in business and uh, Powers Funeral Home? Yes he married Virginia Powers my middle son Robert he married uh, Art Rice's daughter who comes from a family of five six and my youngest son uh, is married and has two daughters. What's his name? That's, his name is William Dale, and he's in. He owns the business that we're in now. I'm the gopher to help him. And I went to Bob Hungate. It looked like there was not much future in farming for me, and I went to see Bob Hungate. I knew him, and socially and asked for a job and within her life and he said I don't have anything for you but I know some people in a company in Indianapolis that might want to hire you and that was the old Indiana Farmers Mutual Company which is 120 years old now formed in Montgomery and Fountain County and they sent a representative to Crawfordsville to check me out and the starting salary was $325 a month. Uh, they furnished a car and an expense account. A lot of the motels I stayed in and nice motels were $5 a night. <coughs> My expense for a month was like $120. Where'd you travel or work? State of Indiana. State of Indiana. And uh, that. Uh, I was in debt from farming and I paid off all my debts and had a little money in my pocket in a matter of three or four months. And they sent this representative to Crawfordsville to check me out and they said the only, the only thing bad he could find that I was a Democrat and they were all Republicans. Oh. Well, uh, this backfired because a year or two later a local gentleman by the name of Don Buck was over there applying for a job. And they called me on and wanted to know if I knew anything bad about him. I said, I sure do. And they said, well, is he a heavy drinker? And I said, no, sir. Huh. He said, does he chase girls? And I said, no, sir. Huh. He said, well, what's his big fault? I said, he's a Republican. And well, Earl Cooper, who was the secretary of the company at that time, done the hiring and firing, he, he admitted I got him back good. He huh. didn't know that I knew that they'd said I was a Democrat. That's right. <laughs> But I was with those people six years and traveled the state of Indiana. Well, what, what happened to the farming operation? Did your, were your parents still farming there? Uh, no, my, my father worked for the Soil Conservation Service. In fact, uh, he worked around Spencer, Indiana. 
worked in Montgomery County a long time and then was transferred to Spencer and uh, I was doing the farming but and I done some trucking on the side but it was just uh, we there was no not a lot of money to be made unless somebody owned a lot of land in your family. How many acres did you? I only farmed like 300 acres all together mm -hmm. but I had a two bottom tractor and that meant that you put in lots and lots of hours. Mm -hmm. who, take, who took over the farm when uh, you? We uh, rented it to oh. Jack Hester and oh. then his son farms it now. You still own it? Oh yes. And uh, we it's been in the family since 1938, I think it is. And I enjoy it very much out there. I've got a, a three quarter of an acre fish pond and uh, got a little woods by the pond and uh, we keep cattle. And uh, I'm, I'm on the farm sometime every day. I don't accomplish anything lots of days, but I, I enjoy going there. Yeah. John, uh, there was an article in the <coughs> journal this week, but but you on senior, senior senior, <laughs> and uh, it's uh, interesting because it kind of covers your auctioneering yes, business. Yes, yes. Why don't you tell the well, people I a had little a, about that? I had a desire to be an auctioneer when I was just small, and uh, when I I'd done a lot of practicing when I traveled for the insurance company, and it. It's not something that you can make a, a lot of money at. It's just something that you enjoy. And like I stated in that article, it's a very emotional profession because many times the reason you're having a sale is on account of the death of somebody or the divorce or somebody being transferred that doesn't want to be. And because it's theirs, uh, they think it's more valuable than the average person thinks, and it's it's a challenge. Uh, we, uh, you have to have a connection with your buyers, and our job is to try to get more money out of it than than it's really worth most of the time. So it's been very enjoyable, and I've tried. I worked for that Hereford Cattle Association for several years and when my children were small my wife and I and the kids would well went as far west as Marysville, Kansas as far east as Damascus, Maryland and they the purebred breeders have, have been known uh, for many years to be a little close with their daughter, you could sell a twenty thousand dollar bill bull, and they want to pay the auctioneer twenty dollars. But mm -hmm. at that time, I would be paid maybe a hundred and fifty, two hundred dollars for crying a sale. But we could stay in a motel and we could eat for pennies on the dollar to what it is mm -hmm. today, and uh, it was a very satisfying experience. And uh, you're still uh, auctioneering some. Yes, right? sir. I still every sale we have, I have a part in it. We sold had a sale Saturday, and I, I you sell on Saturday? household goods, and, and it, one lady was in a nursing home, and the other lady was in assisted living, and the family took most of the good things, so what we had was miscellaneous. Mm -hmm. I call it junk, and my sons went to auction school, which I didn't, they call it miscellaneous. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got any competition in the auctioneering business now? Oh yes. Uh, there Who was, else is doing it? Well, Mike Merritt kind of took the place of <clears throat> a man by the name of Camel. Uh, I can't think of his first name now, but he was in the Linda New Richmond area. Mike and his boy cry sales in all, all over, but I mean mainly in that area. John Saylor was an auctioneer for here for years and he moved out of the state and Todd Cummings more or less took over his business and uh, and they got Charlie Sentman at Wayland. And the garage sales have probably 
done more to kill our business than anything. Uh, I can remember not too many years ago in the month of August we had like seven uh, sales at people's houses. We sold all the furniture that was in the houses. Well now you, you the people, I think that auction we had Saturday at that particular time it was close to 50 yard sales or garage sales at that mm -hmm. time. And a lot of the people have no idea of the real value of their property and they put some ridiculous low prices. So people, they can drive up, see what they want, and if it's priced right, they'll take it. If they come to an auction, they may have to stay there for an hour, hour and a half to, mm -hmm. to bid on the object that we're selling. Where do they uh, care? Where, where are most of these auctions held now? Well, the majority of them are on site if the weather is decent. The others are held in the National Guard Armory and the local 4 H building. Mm -hmm. But the cost of moving the property to the 4 H building and the rent uh, I'm sure they're still in, uh, in the red with the building from the cost of heating and lighting and so forth, but it takes a big chunk out of the seller's uh, profit on the thing. Yeah. Okay. I, uh, I guess uh, I should, should have said <laughs> we're here at the Lane Place and uh, this is uh, August. 31st, I guess, of 1999. Right. We forgot to say what date of this. Oh, okay. This thing gets lost sometimes. Yeah, right. People say, well, when were these people talking? Yeah, yeah I understand that. <laughs> well, I yeah. read in the paper today that <laughs> it was 100, 112 years ago that uh, uh, Thomas Edison uh, got a patent on, on movies. Uh -huh. And we're, here we are. Yeah. Doing this. <laughs> the result of that. You talked about the radio back then. Yes, we. Remember how important the radio well, was to Well, oh my. Uh, and can remember when I was uh, uh, young, uh, we had one neighbor that had a radio and we'd go to his house to listen to it. And when Amos and Andy come on, you sit still, you shut up, and if you said one word, you was out. They, uh, that was a highlight of their day. Was did you, did you ever have a crystal set? Uh, no, sir, not that I recall. Uh, <laughs> but I remember that we also, when television came in, that we drive uh, several miles with some friends that had an old black and white and watch what, what's my line. And here in 1999, I'm, I'm uh, getting the same programs <laughs> of reruns. <laughs> they, oh. <laughs> that, uh, and it hardly watch it now. And, and that used to be the highlight of Sunday evening when you go to their house at they own mail to watch uh, that old fuzzy black and white. John, you know, I was trying to think, you mentioned uh, about going back to visit those people in New Jersey. Uh -huh. uh, you ever uh, see any of these fellows during the service? No, uh, I, I don't, nobody, uh, like I say, I think one reason that I didn't care for the service, uh, besides the danger, was the fact that I just get settled and I was moved yeah. from one uh, one area to another. So you never went to, you never been to any reunions? No, no, no. In fact, uh, I've only been to probably one high school class reunion mm -hmm. since uh, I, uh, the people I like I to see, I see almost daily. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't have that much common in people that live uh, in California or something. Yeah. Okay, John. Okay, thank <laughs> you.